Okay guys, here we are in part three of my conversion story series, the third and final chapter. All right, this is the conversion day. I'm excited to relive it while I tell you guys. Okay, I have a bunch of notes here. When I came home from this day, I wrote down everything that I could remember because I did not want to forget. This all did occur about 10 years ago. So I'm really glad that I have them because I know that I can tell you this story like really fully and I won't leave anything out. Okay. Oh, I didn't even introduce myself. Hi guys, I'm Hannah. This is my channel, Jar of Fireflies, and I am so, so glad that you are here. Here, I make videos all about my life as an Orthodox Jewish homeschooling mother of three. And as I said, today we're talking about my conversion to Judaism. In particular, today is the Orthodox Conversion Day. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Okay, so picking up where we left off, we're about a year after I have moved into the Orthodox Jewish community. I have finished now the process pretty much of my Orthodox conversion. I spent this year of learning with my rabbi and one-on-one -on -one with women in my community. I have been experiencing Shabbat meals and a whole year of holidays. I've been going to services and learning there, just really having this really immersive Jewish experience and I'm ready to take it on and be that person, to be that Jew. Now, my rabbi had called me, as I said in my last video, my rabbi had called me the week before and said, you're converting next week. Okay, so the night before my conversion, he asked me, he goes, what name would you like to choose? Now, if you remember from my reform conversion video, I had chosen the name Miriam and I wasn't super happy with that. So for this time, I had chosen the name Hana. Now, the name Hana really resonates with me for so many reasons. Uh, one, I knew that well, I've been told that I couldn't have children. And as you guys know, I have three kids now. I'm so happy about that, my beautiful children. But so Hannah, she didn't have children. She was praying so hard to God for a child. She's the one who showed us how to pray. I really felt that that just really resonated with me and really mattered. So for that reason, mainly, I wanted to be named Hannah because I was like, anything I can do to help me have children. I really wanted children. All right, so anyways, my rabbi thought that was a great name and we were now ready to go. Okay, now as I also said, we brought in this really prominent rabbi from out of town because he was gonna come in and sit on the Beit Din, on the Jewish court to hear from us and sign off on our conversions as well. And this would really keep our conversions on the up and up. This was really important to me. This really mattered to me because I didn't want there to ever be anybody questioning my conversion or the validity of my conversion. You know, if all of the rabbis were local rabbis, then someone might, you know, potentially could say, you know, oh, well, it's just because they personally knew her and, you know, I don't know, they just liked her, I don't know. There's just that possibility there that they wanted to make sure would not be a possibility for any of us because this has further ramifications down the line. For example, I have children. If my conversion wasn't valid, then my children's Judaism, like they're not Jewish because it's matrilineal. So <laughs> like, that's a big deal. I needed to make sure that my conversion would be valid because I knew that I wanted to have children. And like I had said in my previous video, I think there were seven of us who were going in front of the Beit Din wishing to convert that day. So I was not the only person that we were dealing with and, and we all wanted to make sure we had these very valid conversions. I think especially the women who wanted to have children. So anyways, this third rabbi, totally unbiased, totally impartial. So leading up that week to the conversion, I was, oh, it was just filled with so much anticipation and so much excitement. Everything I did, I was like, oh, this is the last time I'm going to pray as a non-Jew. Oh, this is my last Shabbat as a non-Jew. Like, this is my last this as a non-Jew. Like, I was so, oh, the next one I was going to be Jewish. Like, oh, so exciting. Okay, so as the conversion day was drawing near, as the day that I would go in front of the Beit Din was drawing near, my rabbi called me to discuss specifics of the mikvah, to make sure that I knew how to properly prepare to go in to immerse in the mikvah, to tell me I needed to choose a mikvah attendant. So I chose for my mikvah attendant, one of the women that I had been learning with. Um, she comes into the story later in a big way. So I am so forever grateful that I chose her as my person to come and be my mikvah attendant. This whole time, I'm also double and triple checking that my rabbi would be signing off on my conversion as well, because 
I called around on him and made sure that he was actually a really big deal and that he would be a good person to have on my conversion. And I was told by everyone that I spoke to all around the country that I would have nothing to worry about with his name on my conversion paperwork. So I was very happy with that. And I, I wouldn't have even bothered if he wasn't gonna be on my paperwork. He's a very well-known rabbi and he's very trusted. And that was that really was important to me again because I didn't want any question about my conversion ever in the future. Okay, so the night before my conversion, my rabbi asked me to come over. And so I come over, we're sitting in his front yard, we're chatting and he's like, you know, we're kind of talking just quick little recap of how things are gonna go the next day. And he's like, you know, are you sure you wanna do this? And I'm like, yeah, I'm totally sure. And he's like, are you sure you wanna do this? And I was like, kind of feeling like something was up here, you know? I told him that I was 100% positive that I wanted to do this. Like, yes, I was totally sure. And he told me that there was a possibility and he warned me that there was this possibility that I might not convert the next day. You know, he was reminding me that I needed the entire bait den to approve me and not just him. So I told him, I said, I know Rabbi, everything will happen as it should. Everything will be fine famous last words. <laughs> okay, so now conversion day. I arrive at the shul at the synagogue at about 5.30 that evening. My mikveh attendant is there with me and I was told to come ready to go to the mikveh. So certain things with preparation to go to the mikveh is like make sure you don't have dirt under your fingernails, no nail polish on, a shower before you come, things like that because you want to be very clean and um, you know, so that there's nothing between you and the water. Okay, so we're there, we show up. Now, this was a very exciting time for our whole community. Like it was kind of like a big deal. You could feel the excitement in the air. But when I walked in the building, when I walked into the shul, I was like, oh, something's a little different. <laughs> I could just tell it wasn't quite gonna go the way that I thought. Okay, so first of all, once we arrived, we were told that they were really far behind. You know, it wasn't going exactly on schedule. I was the last person that day. So, you know, I was definitely being pushed off, I guess, because everybody before me was taking longer than they had anticipated. So I was definitely not gonna see anybody at, you know, 5.30 or six o'clock. So shortly after we arrived, I saw one of my friends come downstairs and she had wet hair. So I knew that she had just converted. I gave her this big hug. We were so excited. You know, that was just really, oh, that was great. I was so happy for my friend. We sat down for a few minutes and talked about her experience with the Beit Din, with the Jewish court. And I asked her, you know, what kind of questions did they ask her? You know, I was trying to pick her brain so that if they were going to quiz her on something, then maybe they would quiz me on that. And I wanted to make sure that I was, you know, mentally prepared to answer these things. So just trying to pick her brain a little bit about what was happening up there. So while we were finishing up our chat, another guy comes downstairs and who was supposed to be converting that day and somebody asked him, they go, how did it go? And he goes, not good. And he just like grabs his keys and leaves. And we're like, oh, they told him no. <laughs> and I don't know this guy, I don't know that much about him or anything like that. So I don't know what the deal was, what happened, but he, was told he couldn't convert that day. So now I know one person who did convert and one person who didn't convert of the seven at this point. But at this point, I'm also realizing that, yeah, this definitely isn't a shoe in They're definitely not coming in and just telling us all yes and we're converting. Like this was, this was a whole thing, you know? <laughs> and, and I very well might not be able to convert that day. Like that possibility was more than just real now because it was happening to other people. Like it was tangible in the air now at this point. So now I'm starting to hear the stories about some of the other people who had come through that day. I was told how someone else was told no and how they just, they broke down crying. You know, these these people were being told no and they were being told like they weren't going to be able to be Jewish. And it, there's a lot of emotions at this point, you know, pain for the people who aren't converting, worry for me as I'm going into this anticipation and excitement because I'm going into this like so so happiness for my friend who did convert just so many emotions right now okay so at this point five people have finished with the Beit Din the Jewish court and two had been told no and three had been told yes so those odds are interesting <laughs> So then someone else goes upstairs, they go through the bait den and they are told yes. Okay, so now we're at six 
and two of the six have been told no, four of the six have been told yes, and now it's my turn. Okay, but before we go upstairs, my rabbi comes down and he takes my friend who I brought to be my mikveh attendant, who is one of the girls that I've been learning with, he pulls her aside and speaks with her privately. And I'm like, okay, what are they not telling me? Like, what does she have to do with this except to watch me in the mikvah? Like, this is so weird. There's something going on. There's something they're not telling me. So then she comes back down, she sits with me, and my rabbi goes back, and I ask her, I was like, what's going on? Like, what, what do you guys talk about? So she goes, oh, it's just really tough up there, and she, he, he was, they were just telling me how hard it is. And I was like, okay, you're not telling me something. <laughs> she obviously wasn't supposed to tell me whatever the something was, but that's okay. I would find out soon enough. Okay, so now it's finally time for me to go up to sit in front of the Beit Zen. My rabbi comes down to get me and he comes and he sits with me. And my rabbi tells me, he goes, it's really rough up there. And I said, okay, <laughs> well, this is kind of what I'm gathering here. And he tells me, he goes, they're gonna ask you a lot of questions. He goes, this rabbi is very different from me. So at this point, I'm really starting to wonder what is going on. So at this point, I just asked my rabbi point blank. I was like, what is it about me that this rabbi doesn't like? Does he, is it my swimming or triathlons or ultra running? Like, is there something about my hobbies that he doesn't like? Like, what is going on? And so my rabbi responds very matter of factly. He goes, that will come up. Okay, so something is still not being said here and I still don't know what it is. So I look at my rabbi, take a deep breath and I say, you know what? None of this is up to us. This is all in Hashem's hands at this point. And so we went up. And by we, I mean me and my rabbi and my friend who I brought to be my mikveh attendant. Now, nobody else brought a friend to the Beit Din. <laughs> so again, I'm really thinking something is up. Why would they have me bring a friend upstairs? Like literally nobody else brought somebody with them unless they had like a, a husband or something like a fiance, you know, then that person might come up for part of the time or whatever, but like, Nobody just started out by bringing somebody else up like this. This didn't make sense. Now I did hear from one of the other stories about a girl who didn't convert that day, who was told no, that they allowed one of her friends to come up and kind of plead her case. And so I thought, oh great, they're letting me already bring my case pleader with me, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, this is not starting out so great. Okay, so. I go upstairs, I sit down. There's this huge conference table. We're at one end of the conference table where um, the Beit Din, the three rabbis are sitting across from me. And then I'm on the other side of the table with my friend who's there to be my mikveh attendant slash at this point case pleader. And we're ready to go. So like, as soon as we walk in though, this other rabbi from out of town, like very sternly starts to question my rabbi who like, I don't see people sternly questioning my rabbi about things, you know? So he starts sternly questioning my rabbi, like, what are you talking about down there? And I'm sitting there like, whoa, I've never heard anybody talk to my rabbi in that tone of voice before. You know, he's an extremely well-respected person in our community. He is well-respected all around the world amongst Jews. He's an authority on many topics. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so this other rabbi they brought in from out of town, he's definitely not somebody to mess with. So this rabbi from out of town starts off the conversation. He, he's looking at this piece of paper in front of him. He kind of holds it up a little bit and he's like, so I'm looking at your bio here. And I'm like, oh, who wrote my bio? What did they write in it? Why didn't I get a proof of this first? <laughs> so I don't know what he's reading in front of him. I could assume that somebody who knows me well and likes me maybe wrote this bio, but I have no idea what's on it. I, I don't know what it says at all. So anyways, this rabbi continues. He goes, you're very out of the box. So I smiled and I said, thank you. <laughs> That's probably not the best answer. But at this point, I'm like, what have I got to lose? I can tell by this rabbi's body posture, by the way he's like folding his arms and leaning back and pursing his lips. Like he's, I can tell that he's just already decided no. I'm totally convinced of it at this point. Like this is what's going on. He's not even willing to give me a chance because of whatever is written on this piece of paper that he's looking at right there in front of him. So what do I have to lose at this point? Except, you know, everything. 
Okay, so he asked me to talk a little bit about my running and, and racing and, and that sort of thing. At this point, I was very into ultra running and, and triathlons and things like that. So even though my rabbi had already assured him that I wasn't doing this like in front of an audience or anything like that, you know, I was competing with women when I do these races. There are all women triathlons uh, in my age groups and things. I'm only competing against women in my trail running. I'm really, it's kind of solo sport. Even though you start with a group, you break up pretty quick and you're alone. There's not an audience. You're running through the woods. I swim in a modest swimsuit. I run in long skirts. So I explain all this to this rabbi, like how I'm dressed, that there's no audience, that I'm doing it solely for myself, not really for competition's sake or anything like that. It's just to see what I'm capable of doing. He seemed pretty satisfied with these answers. I was like, okay, checkbox. Maybe I, I won that little battle. Maybe, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so the next question he had was about my writing. Okay, so I love to write. At the time I had a blog, I would sometimes just write things down and send it to my rabbi and be like, you know, this is just how I'm feeling right now. Do you want to read it? You know, <laughs> the whole conversion process and things that would happen. So, but I don't know what, again, this piece of paper says. Does it say that I have a blog? Does it say that I'm emailing my rabbi? Does it say that, you know, I write poetry? Like, I don't even know. So I explained to this rabbi from out of town that I, I write for myself, that I like to verbally process things. And, and that's really why I write. You know, when I write, it helps me sort things out that I'm dealing with or going through. And it's just, it's, it's a good, healthy outlet for me. So this rabbi asked me if I'm published anywhere and I tell him, you know, I don't write for any magazines or books or anything like that. I mean, I'm not like published like that, you know, I'm not really sure where he's going with that question. He didn't pursue it anymore after that. So that was kind of the end of that topic. Okay. So after we had finished talking about my writing, we continued to move on. The rabbi then asked me to tell him about my learning. So I explained to him that I had done lots of independent study and then I started taking classes with those two rabbis that I told you guys about in my last video. And after that, I had started learning one-on-one -on -one with some of the ladies in the community and continue to have all of these discussions with my rabbi. I also explained to him that I wanted to continue learning with these ladies and continuing in Partners in Torah, which I had also been doing all of this after my conversion was over because just because you convert, the learning never stops. I also explained to him what I learned with each of the different women that I was learning with and kind of how that was going and where we were at there. So basically I had somebody that I was learning with on Monday nights, Tuesday nights, and Wednesday nights, and I told them that I was also looking for someone to learn with on Thursday nights. He really didn't have any kind of a response to all of this, so we just continued on. He says to me, he goes, give me the bracha for cake. So the blessing that you would say if you were about to eat a piece of cake. So I responded with, Bore, my name is Anant, which is the end of the bracha. So every bracha, every blessing, it starts with the same beginning of the blessings over the food, and then the end is different for each one. So I just said that part at the end, which was different. And he says, no, say the whole thing. Okay, so at this point, I'm pretty confused. If I say the whole thing, that I'm going to say Hashem's name in vain. I'm going to say it for no reason, and I certainly don't want to do that. But I also want to answer his question, because, I mean, is this like a quiz like a test for my conversion like I, I don't know what to do I'm really confused and I like look at my rabbi like how you know so I kind of begin to say the blessing and I like totally mess it up I add in like these extra words and I'm just I'm so nervous but I was just really confused about how to say Hashem's name in there. And my rabbi could see that this was clearly the issue. So my rabbi kind of laughed it off and said, clearly she knows the blessing. But this rabbi from out of town was not laughing. So this rabbi from out of town, he looks at me and he goes, how's your Hebrew? And he eyes this large blue book on the table. And so I told him, I said, it's not so good, but I'm working on it. So anyways, this rabbi from out of town, he pushes the book across the table and he says, open it to any page and read. I can't do that. Oh. So I open the book and I can't read it. I could point out letters and tell you what they are, but I couldn't remember what all of the vowels did. And there, I just, I was not gonna be able to read that. So without wasting any of his time, I say, I can't do this. 
Okay, so at this point, this rabbi from out of town, like really just, he lays into me. He is not happy. And he was letting me know it. He goes into this big rant about how Hebrew is a holy language and it's the language that the Jews use to speak to Hashem. And how could I not know it? And I need to know it. And that I should be davening in Hebrew. I should be praying in Hebrew when I'm talking to God, to Hashem. How dare I come here and not be able to like, whoa. Right? So at this point, my friend, who I'd brought to be my mikveh attendant, who I should tell you is about, you know, five foot one and adorable, she interrupts this guy and goes, listen here, rabbi. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Really? You? <laughs> Now, she had been sitting here so calmly next to me, not saying a word. She just chose this moment to come in and speak. So she goes, you know, she's, listen here, Rabbi. She goes, I can't believe this girl is not already Jewish. I couldn't believe this girl wasn't Jewish already when I met her. The way she learns is amazing and she is so eager to be a better Jew. She is so eager to learn. She has the most amazing neshama. Neshama is the soul. So at this point, this rabbi from out of town starts questioning my friend. He's like, well, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? They kind of went back and forth and apparently he knew some of her family and she comes from a really good family, I guess. And she's, you know, always been religious, comes from a religious family. I guess she went to the right schools. And basically once he deemed her to be a credible witness, I could see him kind of start to soften just a little bit. His shoulders kind of relaxed. His lips weren't so pursed together. He might've even uncrossed his arms. <laughs> And I thought I saw this little hint of a smile, but that might have just been wishful thinking. But I was pretty sure that he was beginning to consider me. Okay, so at this point he leans back in his chair a little bit. You know, he's kind of relaxing and he, he asked me about my family and how my family is handling all of this. So I told him about my first conversion and how upset they were when I told them that I was converting to Judaism. So I explained to this rabbi that, you know, I bring my own food over to my parents' house and things like that when I go there. And that even though it's not the decision that they wanted for me, that they're okay with it. So then this rabbi from out of town asks me, how will you deal with them once you're Jewish? There are things that non-Jews are not allowed to do, like touching non-mavushal wine that might make it difficult for them to be around at times. So I smile very sweetly and I say, I'm very well aware of these rules as someone who's currently a non-Jew living around Jews. I also tell him that there's probably no one better equipped to follow those rules than me because of these current experiences of being this non-Jew living amongst Jews. At this point, there is for sure a tiny smile on his face, like, He's, you know, like when the little kid's trying not to smile, like I can see it, it's there for sure. I think at this point, he's not only liking my answers, but he might even be enjoying them a little bit. Now I did go ahead and add to this. I told this rabbi that my parents don't know about my Orthodox conversion. I just never told them about it. They knew about the reform conversion and in their eyes, I was already Jewish. And I didn't feel that it was important or necessary to tell them that I was then gonna go do an Orthodox conversion. Just why put them through that twice? They were seeing that I was becoming more religious, so they knew that that was happening. And to tell them that I wasn't actually Jewish, that I needed to do it again, like, it just, I didn't wanna put them through that at all. So at this point, we started kind of chatting about my experience as a Reformed Jew and, and kind of a little bit about Reformed Judaism. And at this point, the conversation had, had shifted. I mean, it, it went from being like this stern interview to an actual conversation. Okay, so at this point, this rabbi from out of town, he looks down at this paper one more time and he asks me if I have any relationships. And I was like, oh, of course I have relationships. I have lots of friends. I have a rabbi. I, I, I'm here in this community. I was a little confused at sort of the odd wording of the conversation. So then this rabbi from out of town, he clarified asking me if I was in a relationship, like if I was dating anybody. So then I told him that, that this conversion was just for me. It wasn't for anybody else. So then this rabbi from out of town asked me, when will I start dating? And I'm like, wow, he's really focused on this whole dating thing. So I smile again and I told him I'll start dating whenever my rabbi thinks the time is right. 
So he turns to my rabbi and he goes, when is she gonna start dating? And my rabbi responds with, hopefully as soon as we're done here. <laughs> I personally very much appreciated his very snarky, but very polite response to this rabbi from out of town. This was by far my favorite exchange of the evening and we were all having a really good laugh at this point. So then I, I did go on to explain that yes, I definitely wanted to get married. I wanted to have children. I wanted to raise a family and, and all of that. And this kind of brought back up the fact that I was in, you know, an ultra runner and things like that at that point in my life, because what else was I gonna do with my time? Like this was a great healthy outlet to spend my time since it's not like I could date or anything like or have a family. So I think that helped clarify a little bit more for him why I like to run as well. All right, so at this point, they very abruptly told me to leave and my friend and I got up and walked out. It was time for them to deliberate and officially make their decision as to whether or not I would be able to convert to Judaism. Whew, it's like I walked out, I took this big, deep breath because wow, what an intense whole thing there. So my friend and I, we went downstairs and there were a lot of men starting to show up for the evening services and all of that and we just kind of sat and waited there for a few minutes. Okay, so my friend and I have been sitting down there for a little bit in the lobby, and then I saw my rabbi coming down the stairs, and I quickly walked over to meet him there at the bottom of the stairs, and I can't, I'm getting nothing from his facial expression. Like, I have no idea what their decision was at all. So he says, come with me. We walk over to a corner for a little bit of privacy. Like I said, there were a lot of men starting to show up for the evening services, and you know, I have no idea, like, does he, does he not want people to see me cry because I'm about to be told no? Like, I don't know what's going on. And he just looks at me and he goes, it's going to be dark soon, so you need to hurry up and get ready for the mikvah. <laughs> it took me a second for it to click and I almost gave him a hug, which would have been wildly inappropriate. I turned and I hugged my friend who was with me instead. Oh my gosh, they had told me yes. Wow, okay. <laughs> So quickly we walked down to the mikvah. There was a mikvah inside of the shul here where we were doing the bait din and all of that. So we walked down there and I quickly got ready the final preparations to go into the mikvah. My friend who was there to be my mikvah attendant kind of went over with me quickly, you know, what I should expect at this point. And I go ahead and I go down into the water of the mikvah. My friend is there where she can see my head go underwater. And the rabbis come into the room and they start asking me more questions. <laughs> I'm like, what? We're not done? So some of the questions that they were asking me were things like, do you understand that right now you could go and get a cheeseburger, but once we finish here in the mikvah, if you choose to convert, there is no more cheeseburgers, which I respond to with yes. They asked me if, uh, do I understand that if I leave right now, nobody will think any less of me, that it's totally fine, but that if I choose to go under the water here in the mikvah, that I become one of the Jewish people and I'm accepting upon myself all of the mitzvot, all of the laws that I need to follow, to which I responded yes. Do I understand the importance of giving my children a Jewish education? Yes, 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 yes. All the questions they asked, I was like, yes, yes, yes. They asked me more questions about God, about dating, about the 13 principles, about prayer. Yes, yes, yeah, we'll do all of it. I think this part down here in the mikvah was taking just as long, if not longer than everything we were doing upstairs when we were in the conference room doing the whole bait in up there. But at this point, I just, I wanted to hurry through it. I wanted to get it done. I wanted it to be official. And then it was time. I went under the water. I pulled my hair back behind my head so that it wouldn't be floating to the surface, that I would be completely submerged. My friend who was there as my mikvah attendant announced that it was kosher. I said my bracha for immersion. And then I went under the water one more time and my conversion was complete. I was done. I was Jewish, I am Jewish forever. Okay, so a short time later, back upstairs in the conference room, I told the rabbis my new Hebrew name, which was Chana. They handed me a cup of wine and asked me to make the blessing over the wine and drink it. It's my first blessing as a Jew. So I made the bracha, I took a sip. All of the rabbis gave a big, resounding amen. That was it, we were done. The men had to hurry down to Mincha to the afternoon prayers. Now, as we were walking out the door, my rabbi told me, he said, I didn't think any of that was gonna happen today. 
And I spoke with both him and with my friend who I brought to me, my mikvah attendant, a little bit more about all of that. And yeah, it really, really came close to not happening at all. This rabbi from out of town did in fact come and read my bio and said that he was wasting his time. It had been a long day, I guess, and based on this one paragraph, he had decided that he was not even going to speak to me. Decided his answer was no without even talking to me or hearing anything about me. And my rabbi knew that if I went upstairs to sit in the Beit Din, that it was just gonna be a pretty awful experience. This rabbi was just gonna tear into me, which he did. So if you remember earlier, when my rabbi had pulled my friend aside and spoke with her privately, he had told her that he wasn't even gonna send me up. Like he didn't wanna put me through all of that. But my friend said that she had a really good feeling about it and that I should be allowed to go up anyways. So I guess they went back and forth about it a little bit, but my friend knew that if this rabbi would just talk to me, she just, she knew that everything would be fine. Now, in the end, it was this rabbi from out of town who said that I should be sent up because after all, I did come here and wait and all of that. But again, you know, he had decided before meeting me that he was gonna just tell me no anyways. I mean, he was basically just going to humor me. However, when the whole thing was said and done, I ended up being his favorite person that day. So it just goes to show that you can't judge a book by its cover or a person by a paragraph. And that is pretty much my story. <laughs> After that, I went back to my friend's house and we had a lovely dinner to celebrate. And it, that was, you know, pretty much it. That was, yeah, after that I was just Jewish and I just continued on with my life after that, which is a whole other story, which you guys get a lot of here. I hope that you all enjoyed this story today. Please give it a thumbs up if you did. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already so that you can see more videos about my life as an Orthodox Jew and just how I live. And please drop me a comment down below and let me know what you thought of this fun day at the Beit Din. I would love to get that conversation going with you. And of course, feel free to ask me any other questions that you have. All right, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and I will see you in my next upload.